welcome to this uh, webinar on policing and empire. It is a webinar organized uh, by the Racial Violence Hub, which is essentially a, a virtual network of scholars. You can go to racialviolencehub.com and uh, see what it's all about. I am uh, Shireen Razak, the Penny Canner Endowed Chair at UCLA Gender Studies. And I'm really excited because today we have three feminist scholars of, of uh, great repute. Actually, we have two. We're looking for in Nepal, if you're out there in Nepal. Uh, so let me uh, begin by saying that uh, this, the idea for this really emerged because a feminist voice on policing uh, was very much uh, needed in the present discussion and particularly so uh, in terms of a feminist transnational voice. We wanted to think together about policing in the global north, policing in the global south, its colonial antecedents, its, its present day uh, globalized uh, forms, etc. Uh, and so this is the reason for bringing these three scholars together. So let me introduce them. Uh, first, we will have uh, Professor Sunana Mera, who is from uh, UC Davis, University of California at Davis, and she is a professor of Asian American Studies. Uh, next, uh, we will have Professor Nadra Shalhoub Kavorkian, who is the Lawrence D. Beale Chair in Law at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and is also the Global Chair in Law at Queen Mary University of London. Uh, third, uh, we will have Inderpal Grewal, uh, Professor Emerita of Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies at Yale University. All three have immense long lists of publications and I don't want to go through the list because that'll take up the whole webinar. So let's, uh, let's uh, start the format, by the way, is that uh, each is going to give uh, a short presentation. Uh, 10 to 15 minutes each, and then we'll have uh, questions. Um, the, we will take questions first from the graduate class on racial violence in the Department of Gender Studies at UCLA, and then uh, any, anyone else tuning in uh, free to ask questions. Okay, so let's start with Professor Sunaina Mera. Great, thank you so much, Reen, for organizing this and to all of you for coming out and a kind of very intense and dramatic week. Um, but I think it's all related to policing and empire. So I'm glad we're having this discussion. I'm actually just going to share a few photos um, from recent um, movements here in the Bay Area. So um, I'll um, just do a little screen share um, as we go along. Um, so can you see um, the slides? Yeah, okay. Um, so my talk today um, takes place against the backdrop of recent uprisings across the US against police violence and to defund or abolish racist policing spurred by the Black Lives Matter protests this summer. These, as you know, were one of the largest mass uprisings in the US against policing, sparking solidarity protests around the world. This resurgent movement that was also in large part a protest of Trump's racist policies came in the wake of immigrant rights organizing to challenge surveillance and deportation of undocumented immigrants and provide sanctuary in response to Trump's assaults on immigrant communities, including the Muslim ban and family separation at the borders. So campaigns such as Migra Watch and Rapid Response Networks to protect immigrants from ICE as well as abolish ICE direct actions were part of grassroots organizing efforts to stop cooperation with law enforcement. And this movement has continued with initiatives to find alternatives to policing and provide real security for vulnerable populations. While many families and children who came out to the Black Lives Matter protests may not have been aware of this though, it was the Black Panther Party that articulated the notion that US police are an occupying force in black neighborhoods and a threat to black lives necessitating armed defense. So Black Panther leader Huey Newton compared police in Black communities to US soldiers who were occupying Vietnam during the war and terrorizing Vietnamese civilians, invoking a global analysis of policing as occupation. 
More recently, the Ferguson to Gaza protests have made links between police targeting of Black and Brown Americans and Israeli police, highlighting the transnational dimensions of the policing apparatus in which the U.S. and Israel are key players. Of course, there is also the perennially vexed position of African American Muslims who are doubly targeted, at the least, and who were also key leaders of Black power movements. Yet missing in some of the recent discussions of the Black Lives Matter protests was a discussion of how policing has for years targeted Muslim and Arab Americans through methods that are often covert rather than dramatically overt. And you know, when Shireen invited me to this panel, I was not sure initially if I wanted to present on the research I did in post 9-11 surveillance for her wonderful co-edited work, but I taught this work um, to my undergraduate students at UC Davis just this fall, and I was struck that none of my students were all aware of the surveillance of Muslim Americans after 9-11, other than the two South Asian and Muslim students in the class. None of them had ever heard of it, no clue. So it seems really necessary to keep this issue at the forefront as it is a gap in these current debates, which not only divides black and brown communities from Muslim Americans, but also colludes with a very intentional state agenda of secret surveillance and policing that is literally undercover and under the radar. So the ever expanding culture of surveillance and securitization is produced by a national and global security apparatus that has stretched from Iraq and Afghanistan to uh, counterterrorism in Pakistan, drone warfare in Yemen and other battlefields, but it has also been accompanied by a war at home. The counterterrorism regime shifted the focus to terrorists and terrorist sympathizers here, especially under Obama. And after 9-11, mass surveillance expanded and electronic surveillance was authorized under the Patriot Act and the intelligence law, including by the Obama administration. Muslim youth in the U.S. in particular have been profiled as terrorists in the making, always susceptible supposedly to indoctrination and recruitment by militant networks or ISIS. So I argue that the war on terror is a technology of nation making that produces youth as subjects that must be protected, as well as monitored, contained, repressed, or removed if necessary through violence. The surveillance state constitutes these racial and gendered subjects of the nation in a time of permanent war. Now, the war on terror also has a cultural front, a cultural war in which Islam, gender, sexuality, and religion are central to the meaning of national identity in Western democracy and secularity. These culture and race wars have, of course, been amplified under Trump, but they are not new. If anything, the Trump regime permitted a discourse about white supremacy and white nationalist terrorism to emerge in the mainstream. Yet these white supremacist militias have not been discussed, interestingly, through the rubric of counterterrorism and national security, though the FBI has long known of the threat such militias pose to society well before they emerged in the pitched battles in the street. By the way, is the sound okay, Sarah? Is the sound okay? All right. The ongoing domestic war on terror targeting Muslim communities still remains invisible because it's conducted covertly, and the war on terror takes place through undercover intelligence and policing operations that presumably preempt terrorist attacks by radicalized Muslim youth in the U.S., surveilling and infiltrating targeted communities with the help of informants from these same communities, so the politics of resistance also becomes more complex and more divisive. Furthermore, this internal war is also one from which the majority of people in the U.S. feel removed, as I mentioned, even if it is happening in their midst and with their implicit or explicit consent. So the point to keep in mind is that empire always works on two fronts, the domestic and the global. I also want to emphasize that the policing and surveillance of Muslim and Arab Americans is not exceptional, but is part of a longer history of state regulation and repression. The state also regulates dissenting politics through the binary of the quote unquote radical and moderate Muslim or Arab or Afghan or Iranian. Radical Muslim youth, particularly males, but also females, must be contained by surveillance. So I became interested in how surveillance shapes the affective and strategic registers of political culture in the war on terror and how we all live with a culture of surveillance in our daily lives. So this talk is based on an ethnographic study on post 9-11 political mobilization amongst college youth in Northern California between 2007 and 2011. It is situated in Silicon Valley and Fremont, where there are large concentrations of South Asian, Arab, and Afghan Americans. And the book from which this is drawn, The 9-11 Generation, focuses on what it means for South Asian, Arab, and Afghan American youth to engage in politics at a moment when this is under constant surveillance. I was also concerned 
with what it means to produce knowledge about communities for whom political engagement is the threshold of who can be prosecuted, deported, incarcerated, or even tortured. These are deeply fraught questions about the biopolitics of doing research when it can become a form of intelligence gathering. Um, and today I'm going to discuss briefly how youth from these communities grapple with the knowledge of permanent surveillance and reframe or resist it through tactics of counter surveillance or surveillance. Young people also resist surveillance through subtle actions in their private lives or quiet encroachments, borrowing from us in Bayat, not always through public organized activism, given how fraught the notion of the public is. So what does it mean to live in the everyday of surveillance? Um, the youth I spoke to struggled in different ways um, with the surveillance, policing, and disciplining of their politics, particularly of political expression outside of the boundaries of what the state deems moderate Muslim politics. Many grappled with the exceptional censorship and demonization of the Palestine Solidarity Movement by the state and Zionist organizations. It's important to note that solidarity with Palestine is often a key marker of presumed radicalization as Muslim and Arab American youth who oppose US foreign policy in the Middle East or criticize the Israeli state are subjected to state surveillance as supporters of terrorism. In fact, the template for the US war on terror was manufactured in the 80s to demonize those resisting US hegemony in the Middle East or challenging Israel and led to the suitoring in quotes of Israel and the US as defenders of Western values against Islamofascism. This is citing Aaron Kunmani's wonderful book. There is a long history of surveillance of Arab and Muslim Americans, and it has involved cooperation between US and Israeli intelligence, which persists to this day. Furthermore, Obama's counterterrorism program drew on counter radicalization policies in Britain in a transnational circus focused on criminalization of ideological activities. So, this is part surveillance, recruiting community leaders to police their own communities in programs such as the CVE or countering violent extremism. So Arab, South Asian, and Afghan American youth have come of age in a moment in which they have to self-consciously regulate or re-narrate their social and political lives as targets of permanent surveillance. This is because the state engages in warrantless wiretapping, monitors private emails and social media, and infiltrates mosques and activist groups. So it's not just those who are involved with formal politics who have reason to be fearful. The social and cultural registers through which surveillance becomes a part of daily life are what I describe as surveillance effects. That is, processes through which surveillance becomes normalized, even as it is resisted. So surveillance effects shape political culture and also ideas of selfhood, producing objects and subjects of surveillance as well as of self-surveillance. So there's an affective resonance of surveillance, quoting Jaspir Poir, that includes fear, paranoia, anxiety, vigilance, frustration, outrage, or bravado. And I argue um, that surveillance stories help do the regulatory work of surveillance in deepening anxiety and producing self-regulation. For example, a young woman, uh, Leila, who was Pakistani-American, attended an Islamic school in Fremont, which had received threats after 9-11, and the teachers were mostly Arabs and Afghans. And she recalled that when students were discussing the war in Iraq, she said the teacher yelled at us and said, don't discuss it, especially in school, because it's not safe. I don't know if this is true, but we made jokes. It's because our mask was taped. Now, she didn't feel safe in her school. There's something very wrong with that. And then in 2012, the stunning investigation by the Associated Press of the NYPD surveillance program revealed that mosque crawlers and rakers had been deployed to ferret out suspicious Muslim and Arab Americans, including students and youth. They were monitoring daily life in bookstores, bars, cafes, and nightclubs as part of a human mapping program in cooperation with the CIA, drawing on Israeli surveillance techniques. So some youth at campuses surveyed by the NYPD use social media in response, including Twitter, to challenge this program with humor. The Yale Muslim Student Association created a Facebook page called Call the NYPD with photos of Muslim college students holding signs declaring, I am a blonde, call the NYPD. Um, so the revelation of this infamous demographics unit triggered some outrage in the general public and it sparked the first mainstream discussion of surveillance since 9-11. And I think it's interesting that young people were trying to counter surveillance through social media by using social media. Um, so the counter-radicalized regime, however, has constructed a socio-psychological model of how youth adopt extremist politics. 
um, influenced by Israeli approaches as well as CIA practices, and they use a deeply racialized behavioral model of radicalization, targeting particular youth subcultures and racial affiliation. So, for example, some of the markers are urban hip hop clothes, as well as traditional Islamic clothing, or growing a beard, or involvement in social activism. This, of course, ignores the radicalization of alienated white Christian youth recruited by militant organizations. There's also a strategy of preventative or anticipatory prosecution, as the state relies on aggressive pursuit of string, sting operations where they set up young Muslims, particularly those who are mentally disturbed or have mental health issues, to engage in plots that they design and carry out. So various strategies of counter surveillance have been used by civil rights campaigns and youth to expose state surveillance. Um, and one of these is to turn the experience into an achievement or a badge of honor. Um, and I think that I'll talk a little bit about this example of how it's shaped political culture of student organizing, because I think this is probably very much in the minds of students right now. So, for example, Aisha, a young Palestinian American activist, recalled the surveillance of student movements at UC Davis at my campus. And she said that the campus police were out there with cameras and we were wondering how much of it was going back to the administration. And so in this context, you know, Alain Badiou has talked about how whenever there is a genuinely political event, the state reveals itself. It reveals its excess of power, its repressive dimension, for it is essential to the normal functioning of the state that its power remains measureless. And I think while his argument is important in thinking about the role of surveillance in revealing the limits of freedom and liberal democracy, the excesses of the surveillance state produce real fear and anxieties. So Aisha wondered, was it going back to the FBI? We were getting arrested. Would it limit our prospects for getting a job? I know petitions are part of the information age, but we didn't want to risk our economic livelihood. So we had to be strategic. We started signing petitions as organizations rather than as individuals. We were worried about going to graduate school. So these real concerns about financial security and career prospects are not to be taken lightly, especially given the profusion of blacklists of those involved in Palestine solidarity and BDS organizing, such as Canary Mission. And, you know, I just screened this film, The, the Lobby, that was produced by Al Jazeera, which features how the anti-Palestinian movement is funded by the Israeli Ministry of Strategic Affairs and engages in cyber security intelligence gathering. Um, so this is a real fear, and there is a cautiousness in this generation I've found about the poss possibilities social media offers for virtual organizing and for electronic surveillance. And in fact, one young Palestinian-American woman I spoke to in the Bay Area said she decided not to use a cell phone or Facebook for six months because she wanted to get off the grid as much as possible. And many had worried they would be denied entry when they tried to travel to Palestine. And some Muslim and South Asian and Arab Americans have begun resorting to face-to-face -face conversations, old school methods from the COINTELPRO era. So there have also been organized challenges to surveillance embedded in the principle of defending progressive left movements, such as the National Committee to Stop FBI Repression. And locally, the Coalition for a Safe San Francisco overturned a secret agreement between the FBI and the San Francisco Police Department to work with the Joint Terrorism Training Fa Task Force or JTTF. Very recently, actually just a couple of weeks ago, the same coalition of Muslim, Arab, and civil rights activists also ended the agreement between the Oakland Police Department and the JTTF. So to wrap up, surveillance effects are complex, reshaping political subjectivity in racial, gendered, sexual, and class terms. Um, these uncivil protests by Palestinian and Muslim American students are policed and criminalized by a global surveillance apparatus that includes state agents and also anti-Arab and Islamophobic organizations. These experiences have propelled many youth, including those in this research, to challenge the exceptionalization of U.S. democracy and get involved with Black Lives Matter protests. Now, while some youth resist surveillance by calling for a rehabilitation of U.S. democracy and reform of the state policies, others have offered a radical critique of the imperial state and built alliances between different communities and struggles. So I argue that surveillance sometimes produces the language of democracy, just as neoliberal democracy produces and requires surveillance. Immigrant rights and sanctuary city activists are part of the movement that has grown in the Trump era to resist federal agents, intelligence, intelligence gathering, and policing. And these forms of resistance help us rethink political strategies and frameworks beyond the parameters prescribed by liberal democracy and aim to create a progressive culture of desecuritization to defy the military spy state. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Sunaina. Um, I want to ask everyone uh, if you could please put your questions in the chat and we'll take the questions after all the speakers have gone. Uh, so next is Professor Nadra Shalhu Kavorkian coming to us from Jerusalem at 1 a.m. in the morning. Thank you. <laughs> okay, hello. Hello, everybody. And uh, yes, it is 1 a.m., actually 1.20 here. Um, I will take you to, uh, when I was invited to talk, you know, one thing that I thought about is to talk about policing and secrecy, a satellite for the policing apparatus. Uh, but uh, today I want really to take you into the issue of secrecy as one of the topics that is connected to empire and policing empire. So, and I'm quoting, secret information, this is all you hear, and this is how they accuse us, imprison us, steal our home, land, and kill us. This weapon called secret information. Then weapons such as the settlers' violence, they cut our olive trees, the secret surveillance satellites, drones, cameras, bombs, guns, and rifles, and their secret agents, those occupiers, behave like a criminal gang, organized criminal gang. And these are the words of Wissam, 16-year-old. Wissam painted the state as a criminal gang, an organized crime group. He exposed how such a state and its political work uses secrecy as a regime of domination, an effective political force against the colonized living under conditions of power asymmetries. He stressed how states organized crime violence can survive without the preservation of secrecy. Now, Wissam talked about Iyad al murder by the security system. Iyad was a 32-year-old man with special needs and was killed on May 30th, 2020 by the Israeli police that claimed that they did not see him or it's a mistake. He explained, Wissam explained to me how those same murderers, that criminal gang, and following Iyad's killing became a secret criminal system. And Wissam's words made me wonder, isn't secrecy embedded in the war machine? Wissam's insight and the long discussions with him about the gangsters and their organized criminality revealed the colonial state. With its terrorizing forces, technologies of power, knowledge and bureaucracy, and use of secrecy and secret dynamics, sometimes called security, to locally and globally produce its ruling relations. Now, secrecy in policing, the colonized, is there to ensure that policing works better to promote state governance. Secrecy, I argue, exists in multiple, ever-moving, tangible sites like satellites and drones to structural and institutional racist policy. It operates within and outside the viewer's site to police and govern, allowing the panoptic gaze to penetrate intimate spaces, yeah? Including the birding room that, that I wrote about, the breath and living and even frozen uh, dead Palestinian body. Now, when analyzing secrecy utilized in state, global, and local policing by using the analogy of secrecy in sexual abuse, we realize that the dynamic of the secret within the abuse is always embedded in intimate, complex, intrapsychic issues. Yes, it is very visceral that furthers the power of the secrecy, allowing it to maneuver to asphyxiate, to scare, to maintain constant apprehensions and deface the horror of its criminal secrecy without even physically touching the colonized community and individual. Governing the public and the intimate, policing with the state secrecy apparatus, its personnel and technologies, the cameras, the satellite, the violence of surveillance, the follow-up, framing some as security threats, the exclusion, the modes of data gathering and data collection attempt to silence individuals and communities, yeah? Creating a word of secrecy and classified information, or some criminologists would call it evidence-based, yeah? Stored in states' secret places to construct the state's definition of reality, allowing the state to govern communities within them visceral and beyond. So generating theory and research to understand the state and empire's constructions and definition of reality 
namely the role of secrecy in state governance of reality and its real threats is an object of critical race studies. Now, by creating crime, the criminal and the real threat, yeah, based on someone's mere belonging, race, gender, ethnicity, or religion that empire construct as the reality and the real threat is, is really my concern. Deepening our analysis to examine the way global politics and militarized state define reality to ensure that secrecy in policing creates dispossession or actually exacerbate the machinery of dispossession, domination, and oppression is critical. The state's obsession with secrecy permeates the political body. Now, Deleuze and Gatry discussing it down into three components. They talk first about it as a context in a box of or an envelope, and second, as an action in terms of its secret influence and its propagation, spread, leakage, and so on. And third, and I quote, as the secret perception of the secret. Now, as Rissam stated, and I'm quoting, the security people told my lawyer that the cameras in the old city videotaped me throwing stones at the settlers. And I'm telling you, I did not. My lawyer asked for the footage and they explained it's secret material. They arrested me, kept me away for months in prison, all using secret evidence. And of course, the judge believed the secret proof, a full conspiracy built with secrets between the police and their drones and cameras, the prosecutor, the judge, the prison guard. My mother told them in the court that we can't really fight ghosts. Now, the discussion with Witham brought to the forefront the secret proliferation of secrecy, the hybridity of surveillance technology and security intelligence, its manifestation in his everyday life, from his walk to school, to his decision as to what to post on his Facebook, who to talk in the neighborhood, or what even what to say on his graduation day. When engaging with the voices of children and their families during and following their arrest and home arrest, I further detected the power of secrecy in its context, in action and perception, and in the fact that secrecy in occupied East Jerusalem was not skilled concealment, but it was what Michael Tausing calls, and I quote, the skilled revelation of skilled concealment. Children's experiences show the secrets, that secrecy is very visible as it is integrated in states terror against them. Occupied East Jerusalem as occupied Palestine became a theater of secrets, concealed and exposed when the Israeli military intelligence accused children using what they define as classified material. Only when it served the government and the narrative is circulated, the state produces exposés, those exposés that are routinely used to further the power of the secret mystery in governing the colonized. Administrative detentions, for example, or home imprisonment and actual incarceration is revealing while at the same time conceals the power of darkness in secrecy because it silences dissent and isolates individual and communities geographically. Now, when police militarization is turned into a secrecy profession and secrecy becomes a political capital in the hands of the state, and when it is internationalized to become an industry that can be sold, a moneymaker, or to train some countries by selling them arms, selling them drones, technologies of secrecy, the way Israel sells abusive countries such as India and Moody, so he can abuse Kashmiris, or in Myanmar, so he, they can abuse the Rohingyas, or the Azerbaijanis to commit war crimes against the Armenians, secrecy becomes a profession. Two days ago, a report published by the Public Committee Against Torture in Israel discussed the arrest of a young Palestinian woman, Nada, from her home. She was taken in the army vehicle, laid under the legs of the soldiers in the vehicle, stepped on by the soldiers' boots, beaten, cursed, threatened, and humiliated. One of the soldiers closed her mouth with his arm, preventing her from breathing. 
The report suggested that most cases similar to this one are closed, and I say due to lack of evidence, and even if she speaks up and complains, the system seldom believes such allegations. Now, the secrecy enables the policing apparatus to act with impunity and violence, and even when there is evidence, like the case of Iyad al who was shot here beside my house in the old city, it still doesn't make a difference because it's the one bad apple analogy that is implemented. So uh, even if it's not secret, it's that one bad apple. Three months ago, an acquainted of mine, a man, was arrested, kept for over two weeks in solitary confinement. When she was finally released, she was bruised all over her face, under her chin. She suffered from severe nightmares, anxiety, restlessness, and other related psychological reactions. What struck me while visiting her was her fearing the safety of her family member. She constantly left me to close her home windows, fearing the Israelis will come to arrest her, kill her family, or demolish her house. When I tried to explain to, uh, to Iman, that she is back home with her family, that no longer under arrest, she whispered, they were seven men, they hit me, they know everything, they see everything, even the shampoo I use to wash my body and hair, they see and know everything. Now the torture of the body, the penetration of the intimate, the violation of the right to breathe, and the invasion of the very private spaces, including knowing the shampoo brand, exposes the penetratability and power of the sovereign policing, usually buried within the immense information that weighed very little when both young women are facing their final verdict. When the Israeli military invaded a man's home to arrest her, there were over 25 soldiers, and they searched the house and stayed there for over three hours. I told her that their uniforms have a built-in camera, and she responded, the cameras are connected to their satellites and they can see and hear everything. And if we walk, they can kill my husband and or maybe my father. Now, the various visits and discussions with her and her family, as with Iyad Halla's family, suggest that the specter of militaristic settler colonialism functions like a secret, a public secret that polices the colonized. And that is widely known that carries a certain official silence that sustains its function as a policing secret to be hidden. Among Palestinian people known what goes on. And in some cases, like in Iyad's case, they know what happened, but no one can do anything about it because the state, the ultimate decider of life and death in this case, gives the policing apparatus such power. And when it comes to Palestinians, officers are mostly not held accountable for their brutality. The state uh, actually encourage such brutality or they would claim it's the bad apple. Michael Towson uses the term public secrecy to refer to, and I quote, that which is generally known but cannot generally be articulated. It is an active not knowing or knowing what not to know by those complicit in its production. So Towsing explains to us how secrecy is, is performed. So secrecy is the hidden satellite that police apparatus thrives off and can't function without. It is in that invasion and surveillance of the intimate, not only in torturing and stepping on colonized body in the name of security and its theology, as I say in my book, Security Theology, but even in the shampoo brand, that the heart of power, the policing apparatus and its satellite vision, or actually blindness, lies. Let me conclude. Um, let me conclude by, a, by using a quote from George Orwell. He says, always the eyes watching you and the voice enveloping you, asleep or awake, working or eating, indoors or outdoors, in the bath or in bed, no escape. Nothing was your own except a few cubic centimeters inside your skull. Now, when I look at state crime, it's policing via secrecy, it's legalities, it's so-called investigation after a case like Iyad al-Halla, the trials, 
communicate symbolically and materially the terrorizing power of the settler state and its global supporters, yeah? narrating secrecy to perform states conquering of land and life is motivated by the understanding that the creation and maintenance of the settler colonial societies involved the pairing of racial supremacy, violent disavowal, and the terror of secrecy. I started my talk by locating myself in occupied East Jerusalem where the killing of Iyad al-Halla occurred along with Sam's experience and the torture and arrest of Nada and Iman. But I want to end with the very recent militarized technological training in policing the otherized threat and remind us all about Israel's arms selling and the violent support. So it's from from Israel's selling of experience, for example, the issue of citizenship law and the, re and the revocation of residency to Palestinians, to the revocation of residency in Kashmir, to selling arms uh, to Azerbaijan against the Armenians, similar to the support of, of India against Kashmiris and, and to, to Myanmar against the Rohingya and other countries. So if I go back to Sam's mother analogy, that was telling us and really uh, asking us whether and asking, telling the court that they're fighting ghosts when the secret of Israel state criminality against the Palestinian is not a secret, when it's political and political economic benefit in selling arms to kill uh, uh, various peoples in the world and its immorality is not a secret, nor a classified securitized data Housings explained that the efforts to expose public secrets often paradoxically reinforce them for, and I quote, part of secrecy is secreting, and thus exposure is precisely what the secret intends. He asserts that public secrecy seems to have, and I quote, built-in protection against exposure because exposure, or at least a certain modality of exposure, is what in fact it thrives upon. In reality, of course, the true secret of public secrets is that there is none, that in fact all is clearly revealed to the public gaze. And I'll, I'll stop here and I'll ask you to think about whether we are fighting ghosts or whether that secret is well known and who is responsible to combat and to challenge it. Thank you. Thank you, Nadara. Put your questions in the chat if you have them. I'm sure you're breathing a little uh, more uh, quickly after this. Uh, let's now go to Interpol Grewal. Professor Grewal is Professor Emerita from uh, Gender Studies, Yale University. Hey, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm delighted to be on the panel with wonderful colleagues. And great to see Nadra and Nadra. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to talk about my topic is policing and security, colonial genealogy, gender histories and democratic deficits. And I'm going to hit some of these, but not all of them. So uh, just to, uh, just to, uh, talk about what I wanted to talk about really is the long history of the, the discourse of police as protection. And I want to kind of go back into British colonial history to, to start to unpack how that is made. And actually, Nadra talked about Orwell, and I want to bring in uh, another Orwell, and you all know this one from 1936, Shooting an Elephant. Everybody has probably read this. And, you know, he talks about how the position, of, he talks from his experience of being a young man in the police and from 1922 to 29 in Burma. And he talks about how the police, how the his position creates this untenable situation for him. It produces a kind of feeling of violence toward the, and contempt for the locals, a lethal kind of masculinity and racism and sympathy for the elephant, but not for the people. So it shows this kind of complicated mix of what colonialism is so bad about. But what I find really interesting about that essay is that it actually misrecognizes the nature of colonial policing as protection because the colonial police was not really there uh, to ever protect the locals. It did in this superficial kind of way, but that was not its logic from its beginning, right? Um, so uh, 
colonial police was actually in the East India companies, as, as scholars have written, the, the maintenance of uh, was produced was in the East India Company. It was there. It was on the one hand militarized for the consolidation in the, uh, of territory. And the second thing, it was for the protection of commercial interests of an expanding capitalism in search of new markets, right? It was there to collect uh, revenues. It was there to also make sure that people paid up and that extraction was made possible. After the first war of what we call the first war of independence in 1857, colonial police became bureaucratized. They, uh, and it became a force for the detection of crime and disorder by the Pol uh, Police Act of 1861. It is, began to identify what was called the habitual criminal, criminal, criminal tribes and new classifications of populations in the way that we know from thinking from Foucault, for instance. Um, so it was a force for the policing of populations, but also in many parts of India by the colonial state, a repression of political revolution, right? By, uh, against colonialism. The police, of course, even in as it's being professionalized by the Act of 1861, where they create this huge bureaucracy of police with officers and local structures of policing, it did not create, create the police from whole cloth. It relied on local differences to produce the police bureaucracy. It relied on masculinity. It relied on notions of which communities were more masculine than, than others, as it is with the military, but it also relied on caste differences to produce different, different classifications of policing, who was the head, who would serve under, who would serve over these different level bureaucracies, levels of the bureaucracy, was very much also based on caste. Right. David Arnold has written very much about the Madras presidency from 1857, uh, 1859 to 1947. And what he shows there was a divergence in the regional administration of police, how differently police were used and uh, organized in different parts of India as well. Um, he says, he argued, he kind of found finds that the character of colonial police was much more militarized than the police in England. If England, who you have the kind of image of the baton lobby, that the colonial police was never like that. It was always much more militarized. Though after 1857, they also start to produce in the 1920s, this group of police that has the, the lati, the stick, they train them in kind of military, sort of using the stick as a weapon. But Arnold points out that there were much difference between the policing in, in the metropolis and in India, right? It, you had mixed uh, loyalties for the Indians who were part of the police. They, were, they created living quarters for the police that were very segregated from the population. That was a key part of the reforms. And um, that there was the production of paramilitaries was really critical to colonial policing as well. So it wasn't just one kind of police. There were various groups and variously militarized groups of policing that became part of the colonial apparatus. So the, the use of kind of racialized categories of caste masculinity, the kind of separation of police from the general population, um, and the ways in which colonial police is always a militarized force is, is something to be kept in mind, right? But what thereafter in the post-colonial state? It's remarkable that the colonial police did not change that much after colonialism. Even as other bureaucracies change, there's a continuity in several aspects. It's still the repressive function of the police, still has many, many paramilitary forces that, uh, that exist all over India, depending on the needs of the region. Um, and, uh, and then there are, the, the who are in the police has changed somewhat. There are, we have women in the police too, and the reservation system have brought in more Dalits uh, and different castes of people 
and to the police. It still has a very tenuous relation to the law in terms of the law and order apparatus. Police still consider themselves as, uh, as kind of a repressive force, even though they have somewhat changed in trying, in arguing that they bring protection and peace to antagonistic communal, to, to antagonistic communal tensions. But they also continue to produce new categories of criminality. There have been so many, some, there have been some police commissions and reports trying to modify and change the police, but it hasn't happened that much. And I was very interested to see another attempt at reform from uh, the uh, human rights organization in India, in Delhi. And three human rights lawyers actually wrote a document stating that the Police Act of 1861 governs most police force in India to this day. They say the police is functioning still as a colonial style regime force, uh, vastly removed from what they call the ground realities. The act they said enables police to use and misuse the police for political purposes. It prevents the establishment of the rule of law and the police to be a professional organization because it is simply a political tool. They write that the police remains outside the loop of prevailing democratic values and that the police is perceived by many as the handmaiden of the political elite rather than as an organization that provides essential services through ensuring peace and security in this kind of you know, hopeful rhetoric of how the change must happen to make the police better. The report then seeks to make changes, isolating police from political interference, greater oversight and accountability, which they say is entirely missing, and making police attend to the law. It revealed, they reveal thereby that the police has simply no relation, very little relation to what the law actually is. And if you actually ask police about the law, I'm sure they will know very little about it, um, especially at the different counter, uh, different classifications of the law. Um, they don't mention in this uh, report of human rights report, um, they don't mention the cost and regional differences of the police, but in India, you have a kind of officer class, but, uh, uh, but the majority of the police are governed by states. So there's a, a great deal of interaction, but also friction within the different policing uh, forces. In recent research that I've done in Punjab with two other scholars, Sasha Sabarwal and Dipin Kaur, we have been examining a, the changing nature of police in one particular region in Punjab and what happened to that policing force in, uh, in, the, 80s, in the 1980s through the 90 period when there was an uprising there. Right? It shows our, re our research shows the gender and caste nature, nature of police, right? as it tries to repress this insurgency. And I became interested because of a famous case of sexual harassment lodged by a civil servant against a police officer, the highest police officer, KPS Gill, who, um, in, who was seen to be the, the person who brought peace and suppressed the uh, insurgency. Um, while the military was used to conduct an operation, a large different operation at the time, the police is actually seen as repressing the, the insurgency at that time. In, in this insurgent, counterinsurgent operation by the police, 20,000 people died in the period, but that's neither the only time nor place in India where police have been used in such operations and where different groups, paramilitaries, police paramilitaries have been used in Kashmir, the Northeast, Assam, and in the heart of India, in the regions of Chhattisgarh and Telangana to repress indigenous and Maoist movements who are fighting the corporatization of the state and the corporate mining companies that wish to extract minerals from the regions. We see resonances uh, across the contemporary uh, kind of use of the police uh, between that colonial period. You see that not just the armed paramilitaries, but the ways in which laws are used, the Indian Penal Code is used to create impunity for police violence. 
What was also interesting in the 1980s and 90s to see the shift in the discourse of policing from simply law and order, right, or even repression to what they called securitization in particular regions. None of this is about bringing accountability or protection. The language of securitization doesn't seem to be encompassing any of those uh, claims at all, which is interesting. So KPS Gill, who I mentioned before, called him, came to call himself a security expert, celebrated for what he called stamping out terrorism. He took credit for ending the insurgency, fashioned himself as a security and anti-terrorism expert, and the two become joined together. The anti-terrorism and security become linked together. Um, and then many, he was called, he was seen, he had a particular caste and masculine identity for which he was seen as both uncouth, but also a good tool of the state, right? And he was used as in the way that the British police used. He was used within his own community to, to put down a nationalist insurgency and to see it as illegitimate. And he did this by calling, by saying that he was a better representative of the community than these nationalist leaders of this insurgency. So there was a sort of he was put up in order to fight the local insurgency, but he was from the same community, so he could claim to be better and a more proper representative of the people. So the several aspects of what he came to use was he claimed to be used better networking techniques, better information gathering techniques, organizing a network-centric approach to gathering information in the region. And also one more thing, opposing the power of politicians and police. He claimed that the politicians and other civil servants just got in the way of securitization. And that he thought that the, that the other civil service and the politicians were, he said, confused irresponsible and ill-informed. So he was a better person. He was more uh, you know, appropriate uh, and better informed in order to put down the insurgency. And he did this by kind of designating the insurgents as criminals and as terrorists at the same time, so that police were uh, and securitization became necessary. He claimed that he is the, the insurgency was a caste insurgency of an oligarchy and an ethnic cluster that did not represent the interests of the community. This was critical to the way he positioned himself. He designated human rights activists as terrorist front organizations and argued that it was only policing and securitization that would end the conflict. No political negotiations were necessary. Despite this narrative of securitization, however, it was some very traditional colonial practices of policing that were also used at that period, right? The, the forms of preventive detention, new kinds of laws that gave impunity to police, um, use of paramilitaries that extorted and used sexual and other forms of violence, police surveillance, entering home and arresting people at will, um, and then uh, he created a special force known as Black Cats, which terrorized the villages at night, as many feared for their sons and daughters. Many people we interviewed told us even remembered these tragic stories of children killed by police, women sexually assaulted, relatives who were targeted by their fellows, and young men who had to leave the country. So alongside this narrative of securitization, you see some very old fashioned technologies of policing as well. Now, if you move to the post, like the very new India of Modi that we're seeing, even the Gill Doctrine, as it was called, seems outdated. Police, police and central police are all politicized, but, they do, but they're also politicized quite divergently and sometimes can be antagonistic. But securitizing continues a pace with control over territories for attract extraction and corporatization. The alliance between police and politicians is stronger than ever. And, it's not, and this is not new. Even as new technologies are being used to create 
new modes of surveillance and extraction, right? So we have uh, Israeli technologies, the import of drones from different parts of, from US and from Israel, Palantir is being used to surveil people. So some of these very new technologies of surveillance, the creation of new laws that would question the citizenship of people, um, uh, new forms of identification, biometric identification, all of these new forms of surveillance are being used to produce some people as aliens to the country and Hindu nationalists as the proper inheritors of the new India. I'll stop there. Okay, uh, thank you, Indrapal. As you can see in the questions in the chat, we have a ton of questions to get through. And so maybe we'll start with the students from uh, the racial violence class. I'll, I'll maybe call on Lynette if you want to pose your question. Hi, um, thank you everyone for your presentation. Uh, my question is for, is for Professor Myra. Um, thinking about this idea of how surveillance produces subjects that are constantly on display, um, I want to think more a little bit if we could talk about the, the effect this has for gender and racialized subjects, and also how counter surveillance techniques might illuminate novel forms of self making under colonial regimes. Great, thank you, Lynette. And you know, I see there's a couple of questions for me further down the chat, so maybe my response might address those, but they're very thoughtful and complex. So I really appreciate your question. And so the thought I had, it's actually inspired by listening to Nadra's talk, which dovetails eerily with mine as well, is that I think that this idea that you've nailed about the kind of public performance of selfhood under surveillance, that contradiction, I think Nadra's already addressed it really beautifully. So I would say that the, the issue is on the one hand, surveillance, like permanent surveillance has been an open secret in Nadra's terms in the Muslim and Arab American community and in activist movements in the same sense that she said, it's like, you know, it's known and not known. But I really, I was thinking as she was talking, like whether this can apply to the surveillance of Muslim and Arab Americans for the larger public in US society. And just this experience I had with my class two weeks ago when they, they genuinely were unaware that this had been going on. They read that it's based pretty much on the chapter you all read, I think, in a seminar for Shreen. They really were shocked. They were genuinely horrified. And I don't think it's the horror of the uh, the secret that had just been repressed and now is being acknowledged. I think it's a genuine horror. And so I think I, I'm really grappling with this, that I think there is a tension. And so I think it's between like settler colonization in Israel as experienced by Palestinians is known. And so every, everyone is living with that ghost. I think over here, I think the ghost has, has haunted and not haunted populations differentially based on race. I think that is the problem. And I, so I think that there are these eruptions of this selfhood in public under surveillance through cases such as the NYPD case with the Associated Press expose, and there's the WikiLeaks expose. Um, but I'm really kind of struck by the extent to which many Americans, perhaps it's more denial you know, than unawareness. Um, so I think that since I did that chapter, however, I would just say uh, briefly that the situation has changed. I think it's become much more known um, that surveillance is affecting people from certain racial and religious populations. We have the idea of black identity extremists being targeted by the FBI, so all of these different valences. And I think with the, the, the lobby film that came out, which again was censored and then it was leaked to the media by Al Jazeera, it became apparent that the tactics that are used in the surveillance appar apparatus targeting Muslim and Arab Americans um, in collusion with the Israeli state and intelligence are modeled on counterinsurgency programs. And this is another thing that connects with Inderpal's talk that in fact, what the Israeli um, surveillance program targeting the Palestine solidarity movement and the BDS campaign in the US has used is a model of cyber war and infiltration of cyber spaces that is actually modeled on counterinsurgency in Iraq. So they used many of the same racialized colonial tactics. 
Um, and so in that regard, I think that that um, there's much more of a kind of you know, public knowledge um, of that production of selfhood under uh, surveillance. And so, for example, a young Palestinian American woman who is featured in that episode of the lobby talking about surveillance of campus activism talks about how they were aware there were cameras in the rooms where they were meeting to discuss their BDS campaign. So they would actually go outdoors. And so, you know, under COVID, everything has become much more complicated because all our lives are being narrated, you know, uh, publicly on Zoom. So thank you for your question. There are lots of questions that are sort of swirling around this issue of secrecy, but also technology, which kind of gives the opposite of secrecy in some ways because the, the messages circulate a lot. I wonder, um, Sarai, perhaps you want to pose your question and, and build on that discussion to Nadira? Um, sure. I um, I was really struck by this idea of secrecy being a function of like the police apparatus, right? And really being crucial for its normative functioning, this abnormal normative functioning. Um, and I was wondering, because I was thinking of um, the banality of evil, I was wondering if this could be thought of, if secrecy itself could be thought of as a type of bureaucracy, um, a bureau like a bureaucratic process that is inherently dispassionate and clinical and procedural, or if it's because it's also an invasion into this intimate domestic space, if it's, if maybe bureaucracy is not the right term for it. And if it's not, then how can we think about like this very specific form of evil that is, you know, encapsulated by secrecy. Oh, is Nadra there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Still here. Uh, yeah, I think that I, I um, what struck me about the issue of secrecy, you know, I uh, my work on surveillance looks at uh, surveillance in different ways, but mainly one of the things that um, I really point to in, in my book, Security Theology, Surveillance and the Politics of Fear, is the element of fear. And when you, you produce fear to cause, and then you add to it, especially if you're coming from psychology and from psych psychoanalytical perspective, is this unknown thing that invades the very intimate because it's in this everydayness. For example, if you look at social media and you think, well, it's public, yeah, you're writing on, on, a, on a public platform, on Facebook, on Instagram, and so on. This is another mode of collecting information, gathering it, and keeping it there as secret as possible in those boxes you know go, going back to bordeaux when he talks about secrecy he 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 talks about the present usually you put it in a box and we you you know at the end of the day you're going to open it and you're going to know what is it so secrecy is not exactly bureaucracy because bureaucracy bureaucracy uh, justifies sometimes as surveillance, it operationalizes it, but it's beyond that. It's beyond that. It's a mode of governance. It goes into what Naina was talking about at first, which is the affected space. So it goes into the affected, into the visceral, and it creates another, you know, so it has its own, it's not one side, it's not, it, it's very fluid, it changes, so you can use it in different modes. It's a political capital in the hands of the state, and it comes, so it goes into the police, and policing, you can police through it, but you can, the military use it, gangs use it secret services it's a mode of dissent also so secrecy is not always a bad thing i'm not saying but what but when you look at it in the global politics yeah and i gave the example of armenia and azerbaijan and the selling of arms that is happening for 30 years and nobody moved until today um you can look at chad and the way they got uh, uh, um, weapons and training and this training because even secrecy became even a profession because this is where there are some surveillance professionals that are there to that could tell you how to play on affect in order to help the surveillance machine work better and secrecy is that path whereby you can invade you can go into the details of the day you know one good example of it is in in east jerusalem where i live in the old city 
on Damascus Gate, there are three, Israel called them watchtowers, yeah? And those are where, where uh, the, the uh, Israeli police, military, we, you know, we put them all in one, in one package, which is this in the Israeli, the security apparatus, but it, it includes the military, the police and so on. And those so-called watchtowers, are watching, yeah, collecting data with the cameras, with the rifles, with the guns, with the with the personnel, with with even their geographic mode of, of putting them. If you ask children how they read them, and I just published a piece uh, on on it, and they they call them the killing boxes. So that secret watchtower that is visible that is there to collect the information about the children on their way to school are perceived and read uh, uh, as killing boxes so it is maybe a bureaucratic operationalized mode of of governing and and so secrecy should be looked at from different aspects from different ways and and look at the way it's being it's being used to further dispossess and control the very detail the intimate the shampoo yeah in in Amal's house because you know they come in with the cameras here on their on their uh, into the house so when they interrogated her they told her about the shampoo and the fear of them them, the Israelis, knowing everything. And that's exactly what they trained the, the Indians, the Pakistanis, the Chadis, the Sudanis, other, and they sell them as, they sell their secret knowledge as an expertise in surveilling the otherized communities. And of course, in the US, I, you know the case of Durham. In Durham, they trained the police. The, the highest rate of, of uh, killing blacks was in those places where they were trained by the Israelis to police the community. So how do you police those that are considered a security threat or a threat to the community? So connecting the dots between them is where I, I, I take my analysis. If we had a map for that, we could connect Jamaica, the US, Israel, Chad, et cetera, to see. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay, um, I see that a lot of questions from the students, and maybe I'll, I'll group them all together. Um, maybe Jessica, you might want to articulate it, but people are very concerned with uh, what does counter surveillance look like? What 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 do we think of uh, resistance? Do do we insist on our humanity? How does this work? So there's a lot of uh, concern for this uh, building off of Sunaina's uh, discussion as well about the sort of new subjectivities formed in surveillance regimes. So I wonder, Jessica, do you want to sort of open your question and we could leave open it to any speaker to talk about? Yeah, sure. Um, so first off, thank you so much for your talk. All of you, it's been really informative and powerful. Um, I so I was reading in in the in the work um, by by Dr. Shahul Kavorkian um, where you talk about at the end of your chapter about uh, birthing the birthing body in Jerusalem and you talk about the um, the power of narrative to kind of have kind of having this liberatory potential. So I was just kind of wondering about the limits of narration and storytelling as liberation in, especially in the context of surveillance and secrecy, when we know like that, like the confession kind of, um, the confession and, and the like exposure as being a modality also of surveillance and of secrecy. So how do we like kind of balance this space of narration as liberation when it can also be wielded by the state? as violence so uh, yeah well in in that piece and i think that number one um narration and winning the power to narrate is very important because states narration is narrating otherized groups in specific way which is a way that would fit their their construction of their reality so the, the black body and the brown body and the South African body and so on are narrated in a specific mode. And what, what narration and owning and deciding how to narrate is very important. You see it in my work on childhood where I see how the Israeli system is unchilding 
our kids using them as political capital in the hands of the state and i come and say well wait a minute let me let me come back and revisit and and check first of all tell everybody who is studying it you know from a, a scholarly perspective that individualizing a historicizing a politicizing does not work yeah and you cannot divorce the past from the present and the very intimate detail from the big detail you know and and and, and therefore the my work on birth and birth in jerusalem is exactly to tell the story from the womb from the very intimate space that covered space, that protected space in women's bodies. But even there, even there, the power of surveillance is invading. So in, in chapter two or three in my book, Security Theology, uh, the title of the chapter is Israel in my bedroom. Because in that bedroom, they decide who can have an ID, who can move, who can marry, how, why, when, and so on. And that intimate invas invasion affects our life, affects our choices. Now, how do we, how do we resist it? By, by, by starting to write it differently, to tell it differently. So if, if the issue of childhood is being told as Palestinian children are terrorists and therefore, you know, when you shoot them, you're not shooting a child, you're shooting a terrorist. So the moment you define the child as a terrorist, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. The moment you define a black body as unwanted, threatening, you know, a criminal body, you can shoot and kill and so on. So I think winning the narrative is, is step number one. But what I do uh, in, in, in Jerusalem is I ask children to write letters. And I have over 600, 700 letters listening to their voices, writing it, telling it, dancing it, speaking it, singing it. There are so many ways to, to counter, to, to resist it. And I, I think that uh, children and women never cease to amaze me. And there are really, I can talk more about it, but this is my way. You know, my, my passion now is in love. I think that love is a practice of freedom. And just looking at the different um, narrations of resistance via love is by itself a fascinating space of, of, uh, of counter surveillance, but it's like, you know, coming from where I am. Uh, I wonder if I could sort of group a few more concerns together and, and maybe invite Interpol to comment. This, this entire session has really connected spaces and times. So we're moving from the colonial to the digital. I see there's a question in, in chat from, from Pornima about, about the digital. But I, I wonder, uh, Interpol, because you, you centered so much on the connection between the colonial apparatus and, and the present day, um, if, if we could maybe talk about the fact that um, these spaces and these times are all sort of folding into a narrative. Is the narrative changing substantially? Secrecy, for example, definitely is not uh, a new uh, technology. Uh, is the digital changing things? So can I ask you to, to comment, Interpol, on that? Well, um... You know, in my last book, I was thinking a lot about what privacy was all about and also looking at uh, precisely the use of surveillance in everyday life. So, it, it, I mean, responding to Pornilla's question, one of the things that I was very interested in is how the kind of subjectivities formed by surveillance regimes, right, that are everywhere, that are in a very banal state when you go shopping online, when you buy your groceries online, you know, the whole project of surveillance is not uh, to be seen only in terms of policing and securitization, but the object of corporate control is not separate from that either. Right. So that the very notion of having a private life of being secret in some ways is not available to most people and not at all to marginal communities. Right. Everything that you do is neither. And, and so now telling me is is uh, is public. 
right? That's a very logic that you cannot be private anymore. Even liberal subjectivity is not available to you at all in these circumstances, right? So everything about you, but the critical thing is that it's very banal uses means that we use these every day, right? It's not just the police using them as, it's yeah. us using them in an everyday way, right? When we, and, and I was very taken by the way it is surveillance is used in parenting, for instance, uh, uh, you know, a small gadget that overlooks a sleeping baby or checking in on a nanny or making, having your, you know, child have an iPhone and knowing how far they have gone. And so using the iPhone as a kind of tether as well. So all of these forms of surveillance have actually changed our relationship to each other. When we go somewhere and we say, you know, find a friend nearby, we're actually participating in that very banal surveillance which is also a kind of form of violence. What if that person didn't want to be found at all? You know, so even even the kinds of you know very banal uses of of surveillance are really critical. One, they produce data for corporations to sell, which is a big big deal for them. The more data they have, the more they can amass wealth. So that is critical. Right. Uh, and it's it's also feeds into companies like Palantir and all of those coming out of Israel. Um, the latest, you know, when you look at the sexual harassment cases in the U.S., they relied on these against Harvey Weinstein. They relied on Israeli security companies to come and surveil these women who were testifying against Harvey Weinstein. You know, so it, it's just the uh, ways in which the military, the violent, the everyday, the banal is just completely mixed up in our worlds. And that, that the public and private is no longer what is uh, available as, uh, we, as we thought it was, right? So, so I think that that, that is really, uh, sometimes the banal is used just as a legitimizing technology, right? Um, but most of the, you know, and of course, people are creative. So even the counter uses that we produce, we produce these uses in order to use the technology for something that doesn't seem to be violent to us, right? Uh, but that's not the logic of their production either. <laughs> yes, but that's not the logic of their production. You know, the biometric IDs in India, people, the government says, well, we will give welfare directly to you. There will be no bureaucracy in the middle siphoning off money. And what does it become? Another mode of surveillance and dispossession of people. So um, I'll stop there. There's been a concern on the chat as well with uh, the dilemmas of researchers in terms of the surveillance that is visited on us. Uh, and a continuing concern with, with kind of what does resistance look like. So I wonder if we could put those two together. Um, Rosie, do you want to ask your question in, in the chat? Oh, yeah, um, first of all, thank you to all of you. It's it's so great to get to hear you speak after um, reading your articles this week. And this question I had written for Professor Myra, but I'm would I be excited to hear um, you you others respond as well. Um, but I was thinking a lot about um, the way that Professor Myra framed it of looking at kind of political resistance in Muslim and Arab, Arab American youth that were mobilizing around the notion of rights, women's gays, human rights, and then also kind of making clear that there's this contradiction in invoking the civil rights discourse um, when. Uh, invoking liberal democracy um, for protection um, against the war on terror. And so my question given that was um, kind of thinking about like the, what are the politics of desecuritization that um, you're seeing when you are like doing ethnographies in these communities? And then of course, when um, we ask that question, what are the stakes and ethics of making those legible in academic spaces? Um, and 
Yeah, so I so I think, you know, I, I think a lot about po political organizing in women's prisons in California. So I was really thinking about what are the um, this politics of de desecuritization and trying to make connections to, you know, calls for defunding the police and prisons that you also brought up, Professor Mack. So those were kind of my clump of questions, which I think definitely touches on things that have been brought up in the chat from a bunch of people. Maybe we might use that question to ask each of the speakers to, to maybe respond as a kind of a set of closing remarks, as it were. Do you want to go first to Nina? Yeah, you know, I um, really appreciated all the questions. I noticed there were a few that were similar about the relationship of research. The academy is a site of surveillance from Ebony and Joseph, uh, Josephine and Anne. And so if I might just also respond to Rosie by way of responding to them, I think they're all related to what the role of the researcher can be, given what we've all discussed about the fact that there's no privacy and that you know there are subjects that are at risk. And so um, I guess, Rosie, my first response um, to your question, which was specifically about alternatives to rights-based politics. So in the book, The 9-11 Generation, from which that chapter is drawn, I talk about the ways in which you know post-9-11 movements pivoted on the notions of civil rights or human rights or women's rights and gay rights. And in each of those cases, how those rights-based paradigms were often imbricated with state projects in the context of war on terror and the culture and class and racial wars. And so I, I think that in, in that particular moment, there was definitely a push to also think beyond the framework of um, you know, kind of a, a Western model of um, human rights or civil rights and a US kind of imperial model of civil rights as a nationalist project for inclusion to think in terms of anti-imperialist, anti-colonial and anti-capitalist organizing. Now that said, I also want to be transparent as someone who is an organizer in the BDS movement, it's a rights-based movement and it is embedded in international human rights law, but I actually think that tension between engaging in rights-based organizing and engaging in anti-imperialist or anti-colonial or anti-capitalist organizing is a very productive one. And so if you look at Laurie Allen's book on the rise and fall of human rights focused in Palestine, human rights workers in Palestine constantly understand that rights have failed them over and over and over again, but they still deploy them strategically. And I think it doesn't exhibit a false consciousness. It's actually a tactical deployment that can be very productive. Now, um, in terms of this question about desecuritization, it is, it's kind of linked to that first question because yes, I think that there is this you know, um, real uh, sort of push for abolitionism that is related to the issues that I talked about in terms of the military spy police state. And so the reason I tried to make that connection in the beginning to Black Lives Matter and also to the abolish ICE movements is I do think that this is the kind of, you know, alternative politics that we see that's resurgent in the United States and even becoming more kind of public right now, um, but that we need to trace it through these longer struggles, right? You know, mentioning you know, the Black Panthers and Black Power and even before that, and that we might also link it to um, anti-colonial struggles in the regions from which Muslim and Arab Americans come, which have also had abolitionist movements, even if we don't call them that. And then in terms of the academy as a site of surveillance, you know, this goes back to the earlier question about narration in a way, because I too think that there is something very important about being able to provide this counter narrative, which is not even like countering the dominant narrative, but on its own terms, like using a different language um, or different issues and different metaphors. And so research can be a strategic tool for exposure of this secreting and of this violence. And so the way I think about it is very intentional and very tactical, but I think all of you, you know, Ebony, Josephine, Anne, and others who brought this up in the chat are very aware that the academy itself it's a site of surveillance and it's also an agent of surveillance. And my students, as I try to bring up in my talk and in my research, are very concerned and aware of the extent to which they are being surveilled on campus. And so I do think that that, you know, constant, um, you know, kind of awareness, which is very um, it's, it's racially distributed. Like I think there, there are many students on campus who are not aware of this, um, leads to some degree of alienation, isolation, anxiety, and fear. And I don't want to diminish that by any means. But I think academics who have um, you know, job security, who have that privilege, you know, have a great deal of power to be able to use that research for exposure and to push back against that. 
So thank you. Thank you. And Paul, would you like to respond? Yeah, sure. Um, in terms of the question of um, counter resistance to these regimes of power, I think there's some really interesting work coming out that I've been reading. Um, Jill Richards, my colleague, um, has a great book on the fury, it's called the Fury Archives. And she argues that in the early 20th century, it, as people begin to struggle for rights, suffrage movements, anti-colonial movements, all of these movements, that we need to look at the affective domain of the struggle rather than at the outcome of the struggle. So she's looking back at the failure of rights actually to look at the modality and the way in which forms of affective emotion, uh, uh, all the kind of various ways in which solidarity is affect, all of these ways in which struggle produces this kind of relationship uh, to ourselves and to other people as being an important kind of way of thinking about what a counter uh, for a resistance, model of resistance might be, right? Um, in terms of rights, I think rights has always been a language of power and you use it as, as I was saying, you use it to, um, to as you can. It's as strategic as you were saying, it's very strategic and it can be used in a liberal context, it can be used in a colonial context, it can be used to all kinds of context. It's a strategic form of power. But, you know, I'm intrigued by what Nadra has also been saying about love. And as I've been reading more and more some of this work and thinking about this moment we are in, which is a moment of great kind of peril, even for liberal democracies all over the world, you know, um, what we see is that there's a kind of way in which the, the kind of idea of resistance itself um, and the kind of identification of leadership and identities and who can represent and who's the proper leader and who speaks from becomes a mode of controlling, foreclosing movements, addressing, uh, suppressing all kinds of movements, right? So we'll see leaderless movements now. We see all of these different modalities that people are thinking through. And I also think one of the ways in which we, we can contribute is by thinking about people as pluralities, that we are not a singularly identity, we're not identifiable, that we can sort of, we're always escaping the categories of the state. The state is never enough. It's always a kind of lagging behind to capture something of what we have been and we have never been. But it's as much producing these categories as these modes of subjectivity that never can actually capture the, the kind of where we can go or what we can do or who we are, right? So in some ways, thinking about not monocultures, not identities that can be captured, but as always processes of making, of proliferation of subjects, of proliferation of communities, of movements, of different plural pluralities are, are, I find, ways to think about it. And those can be historical resources and those can be future looking. So I'm very interested these days in thinking about historical resources that we all have in the stories that are told to us that defy all hegemonic modes of gendered power, for instance, right? Something Fred Moten calls the undercommons, for instance, or um, Tina, um, Tina Camp calls its fugitivity, for instance, right? And I find those are really interesting ways that we can think about as we think away from state power. Thank you, Nadra, the last word. <laughs> well, I was debating, should I talk or should I show you something? But I think that I will share my screen and show you a mode of uh, resisting state surveillance, preventing uh, kids from uh, passing. Uh, if I will manage, I want to do it. Let me show it. Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, uh, just 
Let me see if I can. Okay. I think that uh, uh, Shireen Indrapal and uh, Sunaina knows the kayak and the Palestinian kayak. So the, the fact that they can't sell it and the, the way the kids managed to make a hole in the wall, the wall that separated Palestinians from each other and managed to sneak it inside, sneak it, infiltrate it inside and sell it is very telling. So I think that, you know, uh, interrupting that system of surveillance, people are amazing. They're never cease to amaze you in the way, in, in, in the way they do that. So yes, you know, we need to look at those small acts of smuggling kayak those acts of managing to smuggle dead bodies for those of you who read my article on criminalities in spaces of death there is something very strong in 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 governing hopes and and state is governing our hope and this is something that i think that it it comes in a way and the imposition of secrecy is also another mode of governing our hope. So livability and the power to continue in spite of all the production of knowledge. I see the academy as, as part of this game. You know, I just look at the studies on, on, on uh, what do they call it here? You know, the, the study that looks at what happened in airports and they call it procedural justice. My colleagues at my department and that procedural justice, mind you, is what I call racial profiling. Yeah. But, but, you know, calling it in different ways and, and you know, uh, funding it, supporting it, or using uh, Shireen's word and stealing the pains of others, securitizing, uh, concealing it, and so on. It's all about states in position and governance of hope through different modes of surveillance. And I think that the, the CAC smugglers are only one example of how how people find ways to 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 uh, challenge it and to interrupt it. And if there's something I would like to recommend to students, never feel like, okay, there's nothing. And, you know, we don't have the luxury of being depressed. We need to keep on looking for ways, writing, narrating, thinking, building, coming up with new uh, ideas, uh, participating, acting in order to change that power of, of silencing and of of uh, blocking and of uh, preventing and dispossessing. I want to thank Sunaina, Mera, Nadir Shalhu, Kavorkian, and Interpol Greywall. I, I would get quite choked up if I really were to thank them for what they have given us. But maybe that last image of the smuggling of the, the CACs says, says it all. All three of you know how much I rely on you for that. In Adara's case, I actually relied on her smuggling Kanafi, which we have never managed to smuggle from Israel yet. Uh, but uh, I, I would really like to thank you all, especially for those inspiring last uh, statements, which we all need at this time. Uh, we rely on you and your work has been really important, not only to this racial violence class, but to all of us. And I imagine all the people listening feel that way as well. So thanks again, and thanks to everybody for joining in. Thank you, Thank you. Thanks for organizing and inviting us. And thank you, audience, for wonderful questions. It's amazing discussion. Thank you.